Gwen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge. My name is Jenna Labor, and I am your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Keenan's trial philosophy, The Cutting Edge. Today, we have Benji Boscola with us. And if you are live with us, you have the opportunity to ask him questions. So I encourage you to do so because today is going to be a lot more dialogue between Benji and I as we discuss the rules and the case selection college course uh, with all of you. So if you have questions, but make sure no secret sauce, then please put them in the comment section below and we will do our very best to answer them for you. Of course, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the like, thumbs up and everything else to make sure you don't miss an episode. Benji, what do you have to share with us today about the course that you teach and are the dean of the college for? Well, uh, co-dean. Co Jim, Lyon. Jim Lyons is my co-dean and without Jim, there's no rules college because he does all the work. I'm just the pretty face <laughs> or not. Um, so Jim and I feel like, and probably every Dean feels this way. Um, rules is really um, the single most important course in the college for, for so, so many reasons. Um, and I can share them with you as we chat. You know, Jenna, you know that I hate to just talk and I'm much better kind of goofing around and answering questions, but um, I want to share a little bit about um, my edge journey and what um, Papa Don has done for me uh, in the, I guess it's 12 years now that I've known him, which shocks me, but I think that's what it is. And I was truly... Um, blessed to be one of the first guys, girls, people, uh, who was an instructor in the college when it started way back when um, as a great idea with great people and great leadership. Um, when I met Don, I wasn't really handling PI cases. I had done it um, for a long part of my career for maybe about 10 years. And I, I just grew to really hate handling personal injury cases because uh, I didn't see any value to society and getting people money for their injuries, right? So maybe I was completely tort reformed, probably, um, but I certainly had lost my way. And I was really spending all my time handling workers' compensation cases, which having visited your very green webpage, uh -huh. not, not just because you're in Seattle where environmental consciousness is important, but your webpage is literally like lime green, mm -hmm. which, which is interesting. Um, and I'll have a few more comments about your web, <laughs> about your webpage as we go along. Um, but I, I, um, I love doing comp uh, be, because people who were in crisis came to me didn't know how they were going to pay their bills, didn't know how they were going to keep their families in their homes, didn't know how they were going to feed their kids. And I helped them solve that problem. And everything from, you know, the little case where somebody hurts their back and they're out of work for six weeks, but they're living paycheck to paycheck. And they need you to make sure that they have some peace of mind and they can sleep at night while they recuperate to, you know, um, the young parent falling and dying and leaving a wife and a couple of kids. And what's the wife going to do when she was a stay at home mom. And, and so um, the social worker part of me, uh, I always wanted to, I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was about 14 or 15 years old. And I always wanted to be a trial lawyer and I always wanted to fight for the little guy. And I could talk for hours about that, but I'm not going to, but it's boring. Um, but that's just part of who I am. And part of my upbringing is to, is to stand up for those who aren't as lucky as I am and haven't had all the opportunities. And comp is a great way to do that. I still handle comp cases. I'll never stop handling comp cases uh, because those are folks who really, really need representation. And most lawyers think it's below them. Like mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. I don't know if that's the way it is in Seattle, but in the triangle of hell where I practice, um, 
people look down their nose at comp lawyers. And, and that's a shame because working men and women are what keep this country going and they need and deserve representation as much or maybe more than other people. So anyway, I re- always felt like I had no problem feeling like I was on the moral high ground when I would stand up in a courtroom and fight for somebody who had been hurt working and needed money to survive. I, I didn't feel that way um, about personal injury cases until I met um, Papa Don, right? And um, what he showed me and what he showed us all and rules really is, nobody really thinks about it this way, but it's, it's the stepping off point for us learning that we have the moral high ground. In every single case, we have the moral high ground. Um, and it's because he switched my point of view from compensation to deterrence. Uh, and, uh, and that was a game changer, right? Because I see incredible value to the world in trying to change people's behaviors uh, in, the only, in the only way that most folks care about in our uh, corporate-driven society is by money. You know, money talks, bullshit walks. You know, it's just, the, or what, did I do that backwards? No, I think, money, you're, right. Money, I think you're right. Money walks, bullshit talks, whichever it is. It's one of those. <laughs> Um, but people, mo- the thing that changes most people's behavior is money. Um, that's wrong, but it's, uh, I think it's the system that we have. And, and I think that I've been practicing law since 1986. And I had been educated that personal injury cases were just about money for injuries. And I was part of that generation that was the boiling frog and, you know, mediation started out as a good deal and ultimately became the disaster, which I think we've now with the help of Don turned on its ear. And it's again, a powerful weapon for us. So go to your mediation college if you're listening to this and you haven't been yet. And if you've been to the mediation college, you don't know nothing, go to graduate mediation because you still got a lot to learn there. I'm doing a little pitch for the college, which will make Tony Tony happy. Um, I actually used to teach mediation and um, was one of my favorite courses to teach um, because it was so emotional, right? And there was a lot of self-awareness in that, but um, rules really begins folks thinking about um, their cases differently. And, and if I was going to say uh, one thing about the substantive importance of rules it's that right it it changes your foundation and it starts you thinking about deterrence right we want our group the edge world we want you all to be deterrence lawyers and not compensation lawyers right and and you may not even recognize the connection between that and the way we force you to talk about your cases when you come to rules, right? So Jenna, when you went to rules, who was your instructor? I had Blake. Did I have Blake? I think it was Blake who taught me rules. I had to, most of my, honestly, most of my classes were taught by Blake. <laughs> Somehow he just happened to be my instructor well, for a lot of them. You know, and, and remember when that was? That was probably three or four years ago. So when I started out, I, I took like openings and board year first because I was like mid, I was maybe a week from trial when I met Papa Dot. So he was trying to do like crash course in how do you do all this stuff? And there happened to be uh, an openings and four year colleges back to back in Las Vegas. And so I, right. I think it was Las Vegas. Was, that your, was that your foot case? No, no, that was the ladder case. That was my superstar case. <laughs> well, I, I know about the case. case. We'll have to hear about the ladder case some other day. Okay. Yeah. Well, so um, when you first took rules, mm-hmm. how did you do on describing your case the first time you were asked to describe it in the group? I, I started with my client, I, what most people normally do, what happened to my client, the event. And I remember having to really learn that that is not the way we do it. 
And that's that not is a not a deterrence lawyer. That's a compensation yeah. lawyer. Any person who starts their case, and, and listen, I'm many years old and I've been practicing law for 37 years. So I fall back into old habits. And because of my social worker nature, right? I love my clients. Mm -hmm. I find something lovable about every person I represent. The people I practice law with think I'm insane. Yeah, because, I do. I think you're insane. <laughs> well, I, am, I am insane. The most difficult client in the world. There's something uh, beautiful about them. <laughs> and, you know, Jen, if you have a difficult client, it's because life hasn't been fair to them. True. And, that is and true. their perception of you is you're just another rich person who's going to treat them poorly the way everybody else in the world does. And if you don't recognize the point of view of your client towards you right from the outset, it makes it a lot harder to get your client to help you take the moral ground, high ground, because without your client, it's hard to do. You can't do it by yourself. Um, but I, I fall into that trap all the time. And the other thing, you know, that happened back in the early days of the college, because there were so few instructors, we were all over the country, right? I would teach in LA, which coming from the East Coast, I'd be there for 48 hours and I'd be traveling for about 24 hours and in and out. Uh, and you'd see the same folks all around. And, you know, some of the older folks who've been instructing for a long time, you know, we have that, um, you know, we used to have to walk seven miles to school in the snow with no shoes <laughs> about, the about the college. Right. But as the college matured a little bit and we had instructors across the country, we actually tried to keep folks on the East coast teaching and, you know, within one or two time zones and folks on the West coast. So you'll see that you'll, you know, some of the folks here see me teach a lot. Some of the folks on the West Coast will see folks like Skyver and Feller and, and Blake teaching a lot because they're out there. And, you know, those guys are my brothers and I miss them. Um, but, but just the simple act of teaching lawyers to think about what the defendant did um, is so hard for personal injuries, for personal injury lawyers to gather because nobody thinks about the cases that way or nobody will allow you to talk about the cases that way except the juries the first things the juries want to do is i don't want that shit happening to me right but but the system encourages us to talk about our client and um you know we all know that bubba doesn't give a shit about our client just doesn't care about our client. Our client is the problem. Our client is the reason that we're there. If we make it about our client, we're going to get a defense verdict or a small verdict, and we're not going to we're not going to be a superstar like Jenna. Um, and we all want to be superstars like Jenna. Um, the other thing I want to remind everybody is whether. You know, we've all read the intro, intro to the Revolution book. It's a prerequisite to becoming part of the, the cult, the clan, the gang, the family. Um, we've all been to an intro course of some sort or another. I was lucky. I went to a, a big room where the first day Papa Don had nothing to do with it. And it was interesting because Ball used to teach a lot of science. I know I'm not supposed to say his name, but at the beginning, Ball would teach the science on day one. And then Elvis would enter the on day two in his Harley um, – his leather Harley vest, and you'd go, that's Don Keenan. And then he'd start talking and you would say, wow, that's Don Keenan. And I was hooked from the minute I heard him start talking about what was wrong uh, with the way I was practicing law. And you know, my partner, Mike Ryder, mm -hmm. and, and at the seminar this day, and you asked Mike, when, when you see him, I said, Mike, you and I are going to the beach house. Mike looked yeah. at me and Mike had been practicing law with me for about a year. Uh -huh. And he looked at me like I was from planet Mars. <laughs> what are you talking about, dude? How are you going to make that up? And I go, you just don't know me that well. Right. Yeah. I really need to learn from this guy. And I got to get to the beach. And um, Mike and I got to the beach. We had this door case, a, a door fell on a father at a theater. We lost our case. Um, our first consult case in the premises group with Don. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on about all the lessons that, that Papa Don shared with us when we lost and, and how much better a person, as good a person as we all think Papa Don is, when things don't go well, he's even better. Mm -hmm. um, but when you used to go to those big room seminars, one of the very first words that you hear 
is rules, right? The first stool we lose, learn, rules, codes, spreading the tentacles of danger, right? So rules are, are, are so foundational um, that I think sometimes the longer you stay in college, the more you forget about how fun foundational having a really strong rule is in your case. And, you know, from a, I don't know what the word is, right? So if the substance is changing the way we think and the rule is the way that we can actually deter people from doing this again, that's not enough to keep everybody engaged. And uh, I have said many times, right? So I, I teach a couple of graduate courses and people scratch their head and say, what are you and Lions doing teaching rules? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really quite dogmatic about this. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have um, your best and most committed folks teaching rules because that is the gateway to a whole new way of thinking. And if your rules instructor is not inspirational, you won't come back for the next course. But if your rules instructor is inspirational, believe me, I'm not inspirational, but I'm pretty good at picking out people who can uh, encourage others to go along uh, with us and learn what there is to learn. Um, but if, if you're not an inspirational person, that doesn't mean you can't instruct, but you may need to wait until an upper level course, because what we want to do is once somebody comes to rules, we want them coming back. And if you don't have a good rules experience, you're probably not going to come back. And so when I say foundational, it, it's not just in the way we think. Who read the blog this morning? Because what we think doesn't really matter. Jenna, shame on you. I know. Um, it's still unread in my inbox, but I always, right. always, always read on Friday. And I'm going, cool, I'll be able to use the blog today. Yeah. So it's not so much what we get people to think. It's what we get people to, what am I going to say? Do. Feel. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Come on, man. <laughs> what wins cases? Emotion. Emotion, yes. And so if we don't create an emotional connection, not a personal emotional connection. I mean, Jenna, you and I are emotionally connected. We have been since the day we met. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those weird kismet things. But <laughs> the emotional connection between people helps. But it's got to be the emotional connection to the work we're going to do and the learning you're going to get the opportunity to do. And uh, if any of you know any lawyers who want to be great personal injury lawyers, they really ought to, they really ought to at least go to rules and, and see if, if it doesn't change the way they think and if it doesn't give them the moral high ground. So um, that's why I still teach rules. That's why I think rules is the most inspirational thing. And you'll be happy to know, Jenna. I always take my job seriously. I emailed back and forth with Jim. I sent him my, my little bullet points. I said, am I missing anything? Um, and so I know that he shares the sentiments that you and I are sharing with whoever's, the, probably both people who are listening. Uh, are, are really bored now. So uh, what else you want to talk about? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, with, I, I, you know, but maybe the audience doesn't, I'm starting trial on Monday. And I, every time you go through motions and lemonade, you see kind of the same stuff come up. And all of it has to do with whether they call out reptile or not. It all has to do with educating the judge that this is about the plaintiff. This is not about the community. This is not about safety. This is not about, you know, and so to, and it's interesting because the law says otherwise, but for so long, plaintiff's lawyers sat back, didn't either read the law, look into the rules or for whatever reason, just kind of let this go. And then also there's, of course, with tort reform and whatnot, the public perception. I mean, I was a full on tort reformer before I went to law school. I, I thought there were too many lawsuits in this country. I didn't know what they were about. So as you know, somebody who never met a lawyer a day in my life before I went to law school and became one, you know, there's a lot of public perception about it. It's really easy for judges to jump on that bandwagon of, you know, this is about the plaintiff. This is about, you know, whatnot. So it's, it's a uphill battle, a little bit of an uphill battle for us to turn that around. And really as a entire 
profession, it's turning around the Titanic. And, and Don and Don has done an incredible job of starting that process and kind of getting some traction going there. Um, but I've been reminded of how defense attacks rules attacks the fact that, that there are no rules for society. This is just about what plaintiff experience. There's no rules, you know, that kind of a thing. And what that signals is that it is important and you need to push back on that because they are afraid of it and they know it's true and they know it's powerful. And they're just hoping for a judge like mine, who again reiterated this, this morning, she knows nothing about civil law, that this is how it should be, right? It's not about society. It's not about, and I, throughout redoing my briefing, because we haven't had an actual trial in three years, um, I was reminded of a really good quote out of one of the cases here in Washington. I said, there is no such thing as negligence in the air, right? This is not just about what plaintiff experienced because these car drivers, you know, decided not to pay attention while driving. Negligence affects all of us. It affects everybody and it is a relational concept. And so that's, that's what rules really helps you, you know, that's what that college really helps you develop is not, is your mindset about your case. And then also how to express that relational concept of negligence through what will ultimately become your opening statement, right? Because that's kind of what happens in rules course, doesn't it? Yep. The first four minutes of the opening um, is what we hope you leave with when you go to rules. And you're absolutely right. Jenna, what's your rule for Monday? Well, so we have this weird thing in Washington where every time we say a rule in the format of um, the way Don wants us to, we it gets excluded. So the way we... I don't know. Should I say it? No, nobody knows about this podcast and nobody from defense counsel is going to find it. But essentially I just, I go to the jury instructions and I go to the statutes and I take stuff that they can't argue about. And, you know, I, I say this, I feel like in every episode, but it, you'd be surprised how much stuff is in your statutes and in your case law that is very edge centric. So for example, my first rule is you, uh, we are allowed to assume that everyone on our roadway is going to follow the rules. We are allowed to do that and until they don't. And so then my next rule is we are, the law says we're not allowed to crash into each other and cause crashes. We're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to not pay attention while driving. That, and that is straight. I mean, I have the language a little bit more specific to the, the jury instruction, but it's very layman's and that's rare, right? The jury instructions usually are in Greek or something you know, we have a couple of really good ones and it's basic and it's, it talks about essentially we get as a community, that relational concept of negligence to rely on each other for that system that keeps us all safe. And so that's, those are basically my rules. <laughs> for yeah. my, for my so guess what you did? Um, oh, what did I do? You got the concepts of safety, mm -hmm. protection, mm -hmm. prevention, Hmm. and rules in front of the jury. Now that's yep. some, that's some superstar level advanced shit that you're doing there, Jenna, but it's the same, <laughs> it's the same principle that you'll learn when you come to rules the very first time. And, and listen, um, in Maryland, uh, you're not allowed to send a message. You're not allowed to do anything that, that sounds like sending a message. Um, if you talk about, um, changing the way people behave. Some judges will say that's sending a message. Maybe it is. You are allowed to, def to deter this defendant, right? And so, you know, we have this whole smart ass defense bar that thinks we understand what you're doing. Safety rule, golden rule. Yeah. Uh, and although we want to use the golden rule, uh, it's not the safety rules that do it at all. Mm -hmm. um, but you just have to, you have to find ways to get safety and rule in there. And, and I think, you know, obviously, um, that's an important thing. And, and what you just demonstrated was sort of my, um, my second little bullet point that you and I shared, which was, you are now not a negative person when you're in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. You're an aspirational person. Mm -hmm. You're talking about what the law allows, not what we're not allowed to do. Right. Because isn't that what people think lawyers do? 
they want to tell us what we can't do. You can't do that. And you fail to do this and fail and fail and fail. Well, that's not the way we think in the edge world, right? We think aspirationally. We say, here's the level of conduct that the law requires of us. And there are consequences at law when we don't behave in this aspirational way. And all we're doing is asking you to do what the law tells us to do when we don't meet these standards that are out there to protect uh, us when we're on the roads. And so, I mean, I think you're doing exactly what we want to do, because hopefully by the end of two days of rules, not only are you focused on deterrence, and not only do you feel connected to the edge concepts, you also have become a much more positive lawyer, right? I think most of the people who come to the college, to KTI, are positive people by nature. They're, they're not negative people. Negative people tend to be doubting Thomases, and they don't even come. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I hear, this is just a gimmick for Don to make money, which is really one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life for those of us who are lucky enough to know Papa Don well. Uh, the last thing he's getting out of this is money. And the last thing he needs out of this is money. Um, I know he can, I know there are better ways for Don Keenan to make money than to teach dummies like me how to be a trial lawyer. And so um, that, that's the negative nature. You know, the law is such a negative world. And it's so of, negative. But we're aspirational. And if you remember, Jenna, on Monday, Mm -hmm. you're there giving the, the community that you live in an opportunity to make their, their community a more positive, better place. You're not looking for punishment. You're looking for them just telling everybody, hey, our laws are pretty good here. Let's just follow them and it'll be better for all of us. That's all. Yeah. We're, not, we're not angry at anyone. Just do what you're supposed to do. So, you know, that's the, that's the aspirational part of rules. And uh, I don't think I would have ever known that had I not started this journey. And, and um, I happen to believe that I get way more out of teaching than out of doing, right? If, if I can teach someone how to do it, um, that I've just like tripled the power of the college. And I know, what do you teach, Jen? I teach trial and direct exam which I have not yet taken, but Mike's already creeped me on. So I'm sure. Oh, uh, you that's not <laughs> I'll go, fair. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go to the college, but I, I get a little built-in advantage because we, we, we have a bunch of instructors in our, in our firm. And so yeah. we're cheating a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the third thing um, that folks will learn in rules is this concept of code. Now, don't get me wrong. This ain't a code college. Mm -hmm. And after 12 years of um, doing this, I realized that to me, codes are in the edge world What to as evidence was to law school. I think the only um, intellectually hard to grasp course in law school was, was evidence. Yeah. All those levels of hearsay, and it was kind of... Um, spatial and i love and have, evidence it's you know, still my favorite thing well, you know she just like gets i guess so the other day she was like did you get an a in evidence and i was like yeah sure I, also took, I also took advanced evidence I, to, to me that kind of like specific stuff makes sense it's the, the emotional seat i have a hard time with the emotional stuff but so you know let's face it Pacific Northwest, Seattle, some spacey stuff. We all yeah. know. We all know why you like evidence. <laughs> um, but I think that codes are sort of like evidence, right? And that there, there are levels, and no matter what level you're on in evidence, there's another step you got to go to make that hearsay, non-hearsay. And you know, with codes, um, you get introduced to them in rules in a really simple way. Um, and that's the lawyer code, right? We, we start trying to get folks um, to get off code. And, and you know, when, when people hear what the, when lawyers hear what the average person thinks of them, some yeah, people are surprised. <laughs> well, yeah, and some of them even doubt it. And I go, well, go ask your friends to tell you honestly. And, and, you know, and it was funny when I hear that because most of my friends, you know, we all know I'm married to a lawyer, but most of our friends are not lawyers. Um, and um, 
I have friends who introduce me and they go, he's a lawyer, but it's okay. He's actually smart. Right. The, right. The, and, or you actually can trust him or he's actually funny, uh, yeah. whatever. Right. All the things that people don't think are lawyers, my friends are already kind of insulating me mm-hmm. because they recognize I'm not that negative, know it all. Um, that that's stereotypical of a lawyer and, and that code for lawyers is something we learn. And so in the rules college, you no know, folks get introduced in a very um, simple way um, to the concept of codes. And you did too. I know mm-hmm. you did because that's something we all teach and we try to get people to recognize um, that the code for us is lying, greedy, arrogant, bully. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, if the only thing people take out of the college is if I'm going to be successful in front of regular people, I can be none of those things. Mm -hmm. Right. And many, many places teach, you know, the importance of being off code without explaining the why. Right. So why do you have to be respectful? Why do you have to be honest? Why do you have to care more about your client than the fee? Um, well, that's because you want to be off code because otherwise the folks you're trying to convince won't believe anything you say. But when you show the jury that you really do care about your client and you're just tell them what you're going to do, show them and say, see, I told you what I was going to do. And that's all I did. I mean, there's nothing special here. Do the right thing. It's a lot easier when, when, when you do it that simply. So, Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I guess the two other, um, really simple foundational things that we hope uh, everybody leaves with is that an edge case is a truthful case. Yes. No packaging, no smart, fancy stuff, which is good for me because I'm neither of those things. So <laughs> if, I can, if I can just tell it the way it is, um, I'm better off. I, I sort of have always been this way. Um, my mom bless her soul, still around 89 years old, doing great, driving around her car. She'll disappear to her, our family cottage in a few months. She'll go see in a few months, Bench. Um, but she used to say when I was a teenager and, and I always, for whatever reason, I think the way my mom and dad raised me, I valued just telling the truth and whether it hurts your feelings or not. And I had to learn how to try the truth without tell the truth about making enemies all the time. Mm-hmm. My mother used to say to me when I was about 15, it's okay to call a spade a spade. You don't have to call it an F and shovel. <laughs> and, and she would actually say the F word, which was rare for my mother when she was mad at me. And she'd go, you know, a little less truth might help you sometimes mm-hmm. in life. A little tact, Benji, a little bit of tact. That, that, oh, see, do you know my mother? Because tact was a word. She goes, you have no tact at all. Um, tact was a word that I heard a lot when I was a kid. And so I probably still don't have any tact. I'm certainly mm-hmm. not politically correct. So, um, But you learn the value of trying a truthful case in rules. And I don't think any, I've been to a lot of legal seminars in my career, a lot, a lot before I met Bob Adai. I don't think anybody ever stood up and said, just tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Don tells you all that all the time. We're just trying truthful cases. We're just telling it the way it is. And if we lose the case, it's not because we didn't tell the truth, it's because we took a bad case. Yeah. He always well, says it to me, he goes, you know, when you lose the case, when you took it, dummy. <laughs> yeah. And that makes me, uh, or that brings me to asking you what I wanted to kind of talk about. I'm sure it's on the list. I don't have it in front of me, but how important is case selection because rules and case selection go hand in hand and they are both the, technically the first course you're supposed to take. Although, you know, I, that didn't happen for me because of, circumstance but and why why is it so important that we take the correct cases and just kind of let the others go to other lawyers well so jenna what are the case selection criteria oh no um all right you want me to tell you yeah can you ready (laughs) sorry everybody that's okay you have trial on monday and i'm believe it as you know nothing in my brain Buddy, I'm trying to, you know I'm doing this. I'm trying to inject a little energy in you for your trial because you're going to crush them on Monday and we're going to hear all about your verdict. But ready? Or you won't. <laughs> Go ahead. Eh, whatever. You know what? Okay. I'm going to get to this in a minute. Okay. Trying the case is all that matters. Yeah. 
every time you try a case, win, lose, draw, win big, win small, every time you try a case, you'll make the world a better place. You stand up for someone who's probably never been stood up for the way you're going to stand up on Monday. And you want to know what's in it for you? You make yourself frightening to the insurance industry because you know what they want. They want control. And a lawyer who goes to court is uncontrollable. And that scares the crap out of them. So no matter what happens on one Monday, you've already won just by going to court and trying the case, man. <laughs> Thank guess you. what I guess what I'm going to do on Monday? I'm going to try a case on Monday too. Nice. So, okay. um, so case selection criteria: number one, random victims. Yeah. Number two, Business why should care. Bubba care? Mm -hmm. Number three, what's the system that failed that ultimately led to the event that injured our client? Right. And so, if you don't have those, it, it's tough. Right, it's tough to make Bubba give a shit, uh, and and the uh, the example I always use for this, and in, in when I teach rules, is I go, you know, if Jenna and I are buddies, and last week uh, I go to Jenna, I go Jenna, I'm a little short. Will you loan me a hundred bucks? And she goes, Yeah, pay me back next week. I go, okay, and then next week comes and I give her fifty. I go, Hey, here's the money you loaned me, and she goes, Hey, I loaned you a hundred. I go, No, you gave me fifty, and she sues me for fifty bucks, and we go to court. And Jenna says she gave me 100, and I say she gave me 50. What do you think the jury's going to do? Okay, I was going over it. <laughs> yeah, they're going to give you, they're going to say, give you $25 and get out of my hair because we don't give a shit about mm -hmm. this case. However, Jenna, being the great lawyer, she would stand up and say, it's not about 50 bucks. It's about whether contracts have any value in our community. If you want people's word to mean anything, then he's got to pay me back all 50 bucks. If you don't want contracts to mean anything where we live, then split the baby don't make them pay me it doesn't matter then contracts are meaningless well now all of a sudden you go from a case where nobody gives a shit about whether or not i owe you 50 dollars or nothing to a case where hey man when somebody makes a deal with me i want them to live up to it and so mm -hmm. if you can't make bubba care about the case then you're not going to win or if you win you're not going to win big and so you really have to use that case selection criteria right from jump street Right. right. So um, we talk a lot about that. Um, there's nothing edge that we don't use in our firm. We have uh, templates all over the place that our lawyers and paraprofessionals use during the intake process. And, you know, who are the random, who, you know, what are the random victims? Why should Bubba care? And what are the system failures? Um, uh, we use needles. I don't know if anybody else uses needles. We've got a. Oh, user. that's an old one. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, it's okay. We've had it for thirty years, right? And Do you have a it's... server then, or like you? No, no. Well, we you. So you know, Jesus, Jenna. We used to have a server, and I used to be our IT guy. And so when uh -huh. the server crashed on Saturday night, I'd have to get up out of my pajamas, drive to the office, and reboot the server so we could work on Sunday. Mm -hmm. No, our our data is hosted in the cloud. Thank you. Hey, needles you got fancy. Needles. Well, needles. Needles want needles has its whole own thing, but this uh -huh. is about needles. But, but one cool thing is you have user defined tabs, and, and we've created a tab that's for game planning. And the first three questions on our game plan tab are the case selection criteria. Mm -hmm. And so not only is it important to me and Mike and the other folks who teach um, Ash and Shaq and Sherry, um, it's important to every person in our firm. And, you know, we got like 100 people who work with us, but they all could tell you um, the case selection criteria because it's the first three things we teach them on the game plan tab. And, and when we work together on our cases, we tell them why it's important. And so if you don't have those um, case selection criteria in mind, not only at the outset, but throughout the case, um, you're shortchanging yourself in terms of um, creating a big edge-like verdict. Um, and then I guess... You know, Jenny, you know, I was worried about whether or not we'd be able to figure out, fill up even 15 minutes, but I knew that. we could. I knew we could too. So, the last kind of foundational part of the rules college is simplicity. Mm -hmm. oh, right? So hard. That's the hardest part. What's Papa Don say about simple? That's the genius. It's whatever Einstein said the genius is making the complicated simple or whatever. And it's, 
Oh man, that is so hard. And that course, I think is what takes the longest to learn about rules. And of course, Papa Don can even make that simply go. He's simple, mastered it. Simple ain't easy. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what he tells you. Just it's, simple ain't easy. Yeah. They're not the same word. And so you get introduced to these five concepts, right? Deterrence, being aspirational, getting off code, truthfulness, and simplicity. Mm -hmm. And and these are these are the the pillars on the pantheon that Don is building for us to to learn how to hone our craft. And so um, rules is just I love thinking about it. It's I love teaching it. I love teaching others how to teach it. We use it in our firm. It's part of my everyday life as a lawyer. Um, and people say it doesn't work in comp cases. And to that. I say bullshit because, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, one of the few good things about the practice of law in Maryland is that we get jury trials in our comp cases. Really? Oh yeah, dude. And if you don't think that the safety net, so I, my, you know, what I say in every comp case is what brings us here is a safety net who, who that protects people while they work. Mm -hmm. And the safety net is the workers' compensation law. And it's just a bunch of rules that tell us what happens when someone gets hurt on the job to keep them physically and financially safe. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten an objection. In fact, I've had other lawyers, the defense lawyers stand up and they go, it is a safety net, but it can't be taken advantage of. Yeah. Well, they've already lost the case, right? Yeah. Because now, now they're talking about my safety net. Yeah. Um, and so it works in every kind of case if you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. It works in employment cases and um, when I started teaching rules, I used to ask Don and Hoey, I go, well, what's going to happen when some really smart med mal lawyer or some really smart products lawyer has a case and I don't handle those and I don't know what to do. They go, don't worry, you'll be able to handle it because you know how to teach rules mm. and they don't know anything about rules and they're going to be all the things that you're not, right? They're going to be on code. They're going to be packaging their case. Mm. They're going to be complicating the shit out of their case. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to say, I don't understand. So just let the bubba that's in all of us take over when somebody starts talking about a complicated case and act the way a jury would act and just try to simplify it. Mm -hmm. And you can break down any case. And so over the, you know, over the decade that I've been teaching rules, I've done, you know, prison cases where prisoners are abused, and med mal cases, and bizarro employment cases. And mm -hmm. I've been able to help lots of different lawyers by just using these, these foundational elements and, uh, I, I think if, if we keep remembering those five pillars that you get introduced to in, in rules, um, people might go back and take it again. Because uh, yeah. maybe, maybe we forgot. Uh, maybe we forgot some of those, those fundamentals. Did you play a sport, Jenna? I played lots of different things, but I was never very good. I was a cheerleader. So uh, when you cheer led, were there basic stretches you did before every? Yeah. Why? Well, because if you didn't, you would pull a muscle, break a leg. I mean, there's so much danger that goes into cheer. If you're not, you know, warmed up, you could die. Right. And so the foundation of successfully cheerleading is having your muscles loose mm -hmm. so they don't pop off the bone when you do all that crazy shit you do, getting thrown up in the air and basket caught and mm -hmm. upside down splits and hanging from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't stretch, which is the foundation, you're not going to succeed. And well, rules is the same thing. If you don't have your rules lined up in your case and you don't have all these pillars lined up in your case, you're, you're going to hurt yourself and you're probably mm -hmm. going to lose your case. So um, what else do you want to talk about? Well, that's true. And also if, if you're like me and you somehow didn't take courses, you know, in order or whatever, it's never too late to go back and get that foundation because you get, you know, most of the courses overlap a, a smidge and that they discuss kind of other elements of other courses and how they fit in with each other, but it's not a substitute for actually taking whatever course it is that's being referenced in another course. So I encourage people to go through all of them at some point as your schedule allows so that you have a really solid, deep foundation for, for your whole case. It's going to make, I mean, 
we say all the time that it's just not a magic wand. It's not some like mind game. It's nothing that like just, you, it's something that you have to work at. You have to really understand why we're doing what we're doing and what we're doing and where it fits into everything. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're just going to kind of be grasping at straws. And I mean, even with the discussion that we had earlier, Benji, about what rules I'm going to be using, once you've gone through all the courses and even into the graduate stuff, you know why you're using rules and why they're formatted the way they are, such that because of the unique challenges I face in my cases, I know how to um, reword them just a little bit, not to discard what EDGE teaches, but to use the purpose of and the spirit of EDGE to make my case successful and still be able to use those foundational principles that I learned. I don't even know. So it wasn't that long ago because I think we start, my latter case was in like 2017. So it wasn't like that long ago, uh, although it feels like so much longer. Okay, we have a question from a John. Question. John Christopher asks, I took roles and case selection in 2011. I've taken all of the undergrad colleges and I'm a master's graduate. Do you recommend that I take the current rules and case selection college? Oh, yeah, tell us if there's revamped stuff. What's going on? Uh, okay, so uh, congratulations, John, um, for being a graduate and being willing to think about, right? How unlawyer like is that, right? We're trained from the time we go to law school. You take the course, you get a C. Uh, and you move on, you get your credits because you know what I believe, you know what they call the last, the person who graduates last in their law school and passes the bar, lawyer. It doesn't matter what your grades are after a while. Um, but most of us just go, I'm done with that. I don't have to go back and I never have to think about it again. So congratulations on even thinking about going back to the beginning. You will get 10 times what you got out of the first time by going back the second time because you didn't even know what you were seeing the first time. And you'll go in there with an entirely different POV, which is which are letters you didn't know about the first time you took rules. And POV is not a new concept, but it's a new way of expressing it since 11 years ago when you first took rules. Um, and the other thing I'll tell you is um, if you have a case, a really good case, and you want to make it better, this is like, you know, I run a law firm. And so there are some, there's a little business advice here. Yeah. Um, you know, take the case and make the college a case expense. Yes. Um, it, it's the cost of a couple of depositions. If you don't think, if you don't think working your case through the college is going to pay for itself, then you shouldn't do it. But you're a master's graduate. You already know <laughs> that working the case through the college. So pick a big case and talk to your client, tell them what you want to do and make it a case expense. I've done that. Right. Because I wanted to go back and take some of the courses and I don't want to just pay for everything all the time because I'm a nerd who likes to learn. Uh, I want to make good financial decisions. Um, but it has morphed, right? So when John went to the college in 2011, John, put the name of your teacher in, in the chat so Jenna can share it with me. I hope it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the one of the big things that's been added um, it's really two concepts. Expectations have been added to rules teaching and safety systems and safety checklists have oh, been right. added to kind of rules. And so when we started teaching rules 10 or 12 years ago, um, we really weren't saying that uh, when folks go to stores to spend their money, they have a right to expect the store to have a safety system in place uh, to be sure that the, the floors are safe for walking to protect them from serious injury and death. So it's like this introductory thing. And, and so in there, you know, Jenna, there are codes, there are expectations, there are um, how we're going to prove our case with the, the safety system. And then the safety checklist, the same, the same way you work the safety checklist into your opening. Uh, and we introduce folks to the safety system and the safety checklist. Um, when when they're in rules at the beginning. So um, I would say it has morphed uh, in that way in that it's been added. And it's also morphed in that we don't do the umbrella rule anymore. 
you probably don't even know what the umbrella rule is, Jenna, because it's probably gone by the time you got there. No, I think we did learn it. And I would say that as soon as you said umbrella rule, it made me think of what we do now with motive, which is not the same thing, but it's an idea. It's kind of along those lines. So there was this big general, you know, um, drivers have to follow the rules on the road to keep us all safe. Some big generic statement that nobody could, which was just wasted words because um, it didn't get us any closer to the target. And, and with time, you know, Papa Don has taught us that your opening should be 10 or 12 minutes. And every word that you can cleave out, you ought to cleave out um, because the more you, you know, when you talk too much, what the, what the message you're given to the jury is, I got to tell you all this stuff because you're not smart enough to get it if I don't tell you everything, the ultimate in arrogance. And so, yeah, I would say uh, the college has morphed some, the rules college, um, because what Jenna was saying, there are two kinds of concepts in there. Um, it's not a tactic. It's a system. And it's not a tool. It's a symphony. Right. And it all works together. And you have to be the conductor who knows all the notes and all the rhythms of the entire case to really be a good edge lawyer. And when you know how to do that, they can take all the word, you know, in, in the rape trial in Boston, which everybody knows about, they took a lot of words away from Papa Don, safety, accountability, deterrence, responsibility, couldn't say any of those words. And he, he told me I had to go away for a couple of weeks and just sit quietly and think about how I was going to do the same thing when they took away the easy word, the tactics away from us. They, they can take away the tactics. They can't take away the moral high ground. Um, and then the second thing is, remember this always, the edge is not a destination. It's a journey. And, and just like the easy rider, we're going to keep on moving and they're never going to catch up with us because they think they know what we're doing, but they got no idea. Mm -hmm. And so we got to continue to thrust and parry. And so John, I encourage you to pick a case and go back and start again um, and see how things have changed because, because they've changed. Damages is different. Mediation is different. Openings are openings are totally different. They are nothing like they were 10 years ago. And so they, we, we always keep learning. And, and if you're lucky enough to have a case where you get to be in one of the workshops, um, you become sort of the, the guinea pig where you try some, you know, some of this stuff gets tried out um, and where a lot of the secret sauce gets shared. Um, but that's where the changes aren't just things that we change for sake of changing as our system morphs and as the things we do in court work or don't work, we go back and, and we change what we teach in the college. Yep. Yeah, it's always done, always says, give the jury what they need to hear, meet them where they are. Because if you're being that lawyer who is shoving something down their throat or trying to explain something because they're not smart enough to understand it or you know, in any way um, being demeaning, then, well, what we call it is being on code, but it's being that stereotype, you're fulfilling that stereotype. And, and I just wanted to let you know, uh, Benji, that John says Toby was one and Gus Brown, both really wonderful people. Wow, dude, how lucky could he be? Because, you know, Gus is my buddy from Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, just up the road. And Toby, if you haven't met Toby, uh, I'm not going to try to describe him because I can't do justice to him other than to tell you, not only is he one of the smartest human beings uh, I've ever met, um, and one of the most compassionate people I know. He is smart as a whip and not afraid to use that smartness to whip you with a little humor. So um, we love Toby. So you had great instructors and they're still great instructors um, teaching rules today. And they're sorry. actually both going to join me um, separate, on separate podcasts. Um, so uh, oh, you're, bringing all the old fart, you're bringing all the old farts out of my balls. I am I'm trying to get them back <laughs> in the game. I don't, Toby taught me openings actually. Uh, so, yeah, way back, the old openings. So, yeah. Toby uh, taught me voir dire and then mentored me when I became a voir dire instructor. Okay. And so I've been really blessed um, to work closely with him and, and I miss him. And that's one of the horrible things of what these last strange two years have done is they've taken away the time we get to spend together. And I'm looking forward to, to when we get to be together next.
Hey, which before my before we're one hour, I, I got to shout out Young G. How's she? Yeah, doing? yeah, she's good. She's good. She's actually. Which I don't know what she's doing right now. We're, we're with the trial prep, but she's going to come down and live with me for a couple of weeks while oh, we nice. slog through this trial. Because it's going to be uh, virtual. And so we've got my basement office here where I am, uh, all set up with lights and whatnot. And we're really still be... doing virtual trials. Uh, they don't want to go back, at least in King County. They're really liking it. So I'm like, whatever. I get, I'm wearing sweatpants right now. I love it. Right. That's so awesome. I get sweatpants. I'm good with it. <laughs> so. yeah, it's uh, there. Are, uh, listen, I think nothing to do with rules, but the last two years have certainly should have been an experience that touched us all mm -hmm. in the ways that we wasted time and energy before March 13th of 2020. And, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be untouched by that experience. And we should learn from it and grow. And the things that were, that have made us better people and lawyers, we ought to keep doing that. And, and yeah. we shouldn't, we shouldn't lose what we've gained out of this hardship. So. Yeah, we had so many counties that what you had to lock documents in to file them before finally drag their feet into the 21st century and get electronic filing. I mean, a lot of stuff that, you know, I know there was a lot of sadness and fear and stuff, but a lot of really good things. And I mean, along the lines of being aspirational, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity uh, as well that kind of came out of this. So. All right, Benji, I will let Young G know that you said hello. And, and is she, she, she co-trying this case with you? Uh, she is. We have kind of a an interesting dynamic in the firm. We don't split things up. It's just whoever's interested in whatever case or whichever client, we just kind of cases fall to one or the other who ends up being a lead. And then the other person is the supporting person. So uh, this happens to be my lead case. And she's the, I say supporting person just because I'm doing most of it, but you know how important that person is, right? And making sure you're sane and eating and not forgetting how to use the technology and whatnot. So uh, well, give, incredible give, support. Give her a big hug for me when you say I that. will. I will. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Benji. I appreciate it. And good luck with your trial on Monday. And everybody else, thank you for joining us here live this week. As always, we'll put Benji's contact information in the description below. So if you have questions about the college or anything Edge, please feel free to reach out to him. He's a wonderful resource. And also don't forget to subscribe. And if you like the episode, like it. And we will see you all next week when we have Brian and B.B. Sanford on to talk about their $70 million verdict. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you next time.